set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou a little while, that I may show thee the word of God. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so we have just read 1 Samuel chapter 9. Um, I'm just going to put that over there. All right, so we can see that and we're going to write on that. Now, the record of Samuel is a huge record. It's very long. It goes right from chapter 8 all the way through to chapter 31 of uh, 1 Samuel. So there's a lot of information about Saul as a character. Now, to understand the, the character of Saul, you actually have to see uh, how the divine record has actually um, re- chosen to set out his life. And if we see how his life is set out, that's what will give us a real good understanding of what his character's like. Okay, so I just want you to... Uh, now, I've written it on the other side of this, actually. So I would just want you to go through this with me Quickly, just so you can see how the divine record actually sets out his life. Okay, so if you just look at chapter 8, you'll see chapter 8 is all about um, the people asking for a king. Okay, so we've just come out of the time of the judges, you know that. Okay, and the people are wanting a king because of the nations that are around them and, um, and they're they always, get, always getting invaded. Okay, so they say to Samuel, for example, in verse 5, Okay, uh, behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like the nations. And verse 20, that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us to fight our battles. All right, so chapter 8 is all about um, the people asking for a king. Well, chapter 9 then is all about the character of the king. And that's what we're going to see tonight. Chapter 9 is about the character of the king. Chapter 10 is all about how the king is anointed. Okay, and you know that classic verse where he goes and hides himself um, in verse 22. And we'll talk about that as well. So chapter, so chapter 10 is all about the anointing of the king. Okay, um, chapter 11 is all about Saul's first act as king because the Ammonites come against and they want to poke out these other guys' eyes. And, um, and so um, it's all about Saul's first act as king as he is enraged by that. Okay, now, so that's chapter 11. Then in chapter 12, well, chapter 12 is all about Samuel, how he remonstrates with the people. He tells them off for asking for a king because that wasn't what they were supposed to do. Okay, and, but he says at the end of chapter 12, look, verse 24, I'm going to teach you the, the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him with truth, with all your heart, cause, and consider how great things he's done for you. So Samuel really remonstrates with the people in chapter 12. And then the record changes. So, it then says, so we have then chapter 13, 14, and 15, and they're in like this block together. So 13, 14, and 15, it starts off, Saul reigned one year, and when he'd reigned two years over Israel. And then you've got these incidents in chapter 13, 14, and 15, which we're going to look at tonight, um, that are all about... It's, it's like a cameo of Saul's whole life, okay? Um, because everything that happens in 13, 14, and 15 is then repeated all the way through the rest of his life. It's a cameo. So chapter 13 says when he, when he Saul reigned one year and when he reigned two years, and look at the end of chapter 15, it says, last verse of chapter 15, and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. And that's it. 
All right, so that's, that's the beginning. It's like little brackets that come on the, the beginning and the end of that section. All right, and in those chapter 13, 14, and 15, Saul is rejected twice by God. Okay, he's rejected in um, chapter 13, verse 14, where it says, But now thy kingdom shall not continue, and Yahweh has sought a man after his own heart. And so Saul is told that his dynasty is not going to continue. So from then on, Jonathan knows he's not going to be king because his line is not going to continue from in chapter 13. And then in chapter 15, he's told in verse uh, 26. So 15 verse 26, it says, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of Yahweh, and Yahweh has rejected thee from being king. So he himself personally is now being rejected. Okay, not just his dynasty, himself personally has been rejected. So 13, 14, and 15 are a cameo of Saul's whole life. Okay? And then you have 16 more chapters on Saul's life. And you think, why does God allow 16 more chapters? And you know what happens in those 16 chapters? Like I've written there, Saul fails to be influenced for good by those around him. 16 more chapters where Saul is... His character is worked on and he's got this ability to change, but he never, ever, ever does. He stubbornly resists every single good influence that happens in his life. And God brings many good influences in Saul's life. And yet he never, for 16 chapters, never allows those good influences to, to um, work on his character. Okay, and all the mistakes that he makes in chapter 13, 14, and 15, he just repeats the same things over and over and over again in, those, in the rest of those chapters until he's finally killed or suicides, as the case is. All right, so let's now have a look then at his actual character and see what this man is like. Because in chapter 9 and 10 and 11, um, you actually see what this man's like and those characteristics then are in the cameo of his life. So we're going to look in chapter 9 and a little bit in chapter 10 and 11 and see what he's like and we're going to write that down and then we're going to see how that works out in the cameo of his life. And if we've got time, we might just have a look at one in, um, in the rest of his life. Right, so now I need you guys to, uh, I need you guys to um, be sharp here now, okay? And we're going to brainstorm this together. Okay, so... So you, don't, you mustn't be shy, all right? Because if you say the wrong answer, I'll just turn it around and make it right. And then you won't, you know? All right, so in chapter 9, verse 3, what do we see about Saul here? 9, verse 3 um, says, now, he's, he's the asses of Saul's father were lost, okay? And his father has to say to him, go and seek the asses. What does that tell you about Saul? He was obedient to his parent. He was obedient to his parent. Okay, well, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, okay. He Just <laughs> He lacked initiative. Okay, so this is good. So, he lacked initiative. I, I actually wrote, I think I might use, I might use purple. Oh, no, not use purple. Let's use this one. He lacked initiative. He's lost the asses. What does that tell you about him? He's irresponsible. He's irresponsible. Okay, so he's... Okay, he's irresponsible, and if you've lost the asses, what does that make you in terms of a shepherd? A bad one. Okay, so he's a bad shepherd. All right, you'll have to excuse my spelling. If I make any spelling mistakes, all right, it's, uh, it's just because I'm testing you. All right, so that's the first thing that we learn about Saul. He's actually irresponsible. And you know what? Yes, he did listen to his dad, but how's this? If you've lost something of your parents that's very valuable, what, would, what do you think you would do? Do you wait for your dad to tell you to go look for it? You go get it before he finds out. You go get it before he finds out, exactly. These are very valuable things. And if they have gone missing, surely you would go and have a look for them before dad finds out, or at least before he tells you. You know what? I think you might want to go and look for those. Yeah? Okay? So he's actually a really irresponsible person. All right. Now, 
what do you reckon about this? Okay, so he goes, he, 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 he goes off with his servant, and they go through the land of Benjamin, and they, and they can't find them at the end of verse 4. It says, but they found them not. And then they go through the land of Zaph, and, um, and that was actually Samuel's home territory. Okay, and, they, and then Saul says, come, let us return. And we know that's actually after three days, because verse 20 tells us it's after three days. So he spends three days looking, and then he says, oh, look, can't find them. I think we're going to have to go home. What does that tell you about him? He gives up easily. Excellent. So, he never sees a job right through. He never sees a job right through. You know, like, this is seriously annoying. If you're on a committee and you get given a job to do, and then the, you know, the person in the committee says, oh, have you done that job? Have you done that job? Have you done that job? That's not the way to be. Okay? And that's the kind of person Saul was. Okay? Not only is he irresponsible, but when he gets given a job, he actually can't see it all the way through right to the end. Okay? Right, well, so what do you think about this one? Uh, verse 7. So he's gone off. They've spent three days, and then all of a sudden he finds, he says, oh, uh, well, there's this, 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 there's this prophet here. Okay, well, what are we going to give him? The bread is spent. There's, no, there's, no more, there's nothing. We don't have anything. What, what have we got? What does that tell you about him? He's unprepared. Excellent. Gee, you must have read my notes. All right, so he's unprepared. Okay, so, I mean... If you've got these donkeys or these asses that are lost, and you're going to now go and look for them, sure, his dad is a wealthy man, okay? Because that's what it says in verse 1, okay? He was uh, the son of, this, uh, of, um, of Kish, who was a mighty man of power, and your margin says of substance, okay? He was a mighty man of wealth and of influence. The whole nation was looking to this, this family for a king, and he goes off on this three-day journey to find these asses. He doesn't take any money or any food with him. Or enough, you know, not enough, and he runs out. Seriously irresponsible. Unprepared. Okay? Right, well, then he gets to the city. So the servant says, okay, look, there's a man of God here. Yep, okay, we'll go find him. So, now, you would think that when you go to the city, there's a man of God in the city. What normally happened at the gate of the city? Who were normally sitting at the gate of the city? Judges, yeah, and elders, and yeah, people who were ruling the city. That's where it all happened, okay? You would think you'd go to the gate of the city and say, okay, so where's the, where does Saul go? Well, verse 11, and when they went up to the hill of the city, they found the young maidens going out to draw water. And he says to them, oh, is the seer here? Okay? So he sees all these girls coming out, and this is his pickup line. Oh, hi, girls, you know, is the seer here? You know, tall, good-looking fella. All right, so what does that tell you about him? He's a ladies' man, exactly. He's a ladies' man. He's egotistical. All right, he's egotistical and a ladies' man. Oh, yeah, well, generally I listen to my wife, okay? So, um, all right, so... Now, this is a comical situation that actually happens then. Because now, Samuel actually comes out the city, all right, in verse 18. And Saul drew near to Samuel on the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, is the, where the seer's house is? Now, young people, you had a class on Samuel last, uh, last class, okay, four weeks ago, whatever it was. Samuel was the most conspicuous figure in Israel. He was a Nazarite since his birth. How long was his hair? He's now an old man. Okay, he would have been right down on the floor, probably all bunched up and tied up, okay? And he had this, this, um, this mantle that he used to wear. It was really obvious who Samuel was. And guess what? Saul actually lived near a school of prophets, only five k's away in the same, ta like, well, in the same area, and Samuel would have been there all the time. And he walks up to Samuel and he says, 
can you tell me who the seer is? What does that tell you about him? Unspiritual, yeah, I actually think that's right. So, I, I okay, so he's unobservant to start with, but I think looking at it from a spiritual perspective, I actually think he's, um, he's spiritually blind. Okay, so unobservant or spiritually blind. Okay, uh, I might write that unobservant. I think that's right in terms of the spelling. Not sure. Anyway, all right, unobservant. Okay, spiritually blind. Okay, now, what do you think of this? Okay, so then Samuel then talks to him, okay, and he says, now, now remember what verse 1 said? He was actually from a house, a family, who the whole nation were looking to for a king. Okay, now you don't look to the poorest, most you know, uninfluential family in the nation, all right? So Samuel says to him, in verse 20, end of verse 20, on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? So everyone in the nation is looking to you, Saul, to be king. And Saul knew that, okay? And Saul answers and said, oh, look, you know, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? Well, that was true enough. And he says, and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, was that true? Was his family the least of all the families of Benjamin? No. No. So what does that make him? A liar. A liar. Okay. That makes him a liar. All right? Now you could say he was just, you know, being humble here, maybe. I don't know. But actually, when you see the rest of his character through, okay, so what are we, what are we seeing here? You might be thinking, oh, are we judging this guy really harshly? Well, actually, young people, you're going to see that these are all shadows. You know, it says in the Proverbs that a child is known, even a child is known by his, his, his doings, okay? Well, these are all just shadows of what he's like, and you're going to see them now just blossom and grow in chapter 13 and 15. 13 to 15, all right. Okay, so he's a liar. Right, what about chapter 9, verse 26? Okay, so Samuel has now spent, Samuel has actually honored him greatly at this feast. Okay, he's given him the chief place at the feast amongst 30 people in verse 22. And then Samuel has given him the shoulder of the offering, which was normally the priest's portion. So Samuel has greatly honored Saul. And by the way, Saul would have absolutely loved that. Okay, and then they've spent the afternoon or the, or the evening chatting, about, probably about the kingdom. Okay, and, and then he's made him a bed upstairs on the roof and he's gone off to sleep. Now, verse 26, and it came to pass, and they rose early, so that's like a summary uh, statement. And it came to pass, verse 26, about the spring of the day that Samuel called to Saul to the top of the house and said, Up, that I may send thee away. Right, what does that tell you about Saul? He's self centered. You were at school of the prophets. Well done. <laughs> was that you? No, no. Did you just say that? It was you who said self-centered. Yeah, well done. Self-centered. Oh, that's fantastic. Why? Because he's lazy. Yeah. You know, you would think, okay, you would think that this, is a, this young man has just been honored by this gr the greatest personage in the entire nation of Israel. You would think that he would get up and go, Samuel, oh, let me make you a cup of coffee. At the very least, he would have made some hot water, okay, and said, yeah, I've just prepared some hot water for you to wash your face in the morning. Or at least he'd have been up waiting, ready, okay, Samuel, what's the program for today? But no, he's just having a sleep in, isn't he? He doesn't care about anybody except himself. And he has to wait for Samuel to say, hey, come on, get out of bed. He's self-centered. All right? Now, what about chapter 10, verse 7? Now, this is a little bit of a difficult one. Okay, so chapter 10, verse 7, he's actually, and we're going to look at these three signs here quickly, but he's actually been told that, these, that God is going to be with him in chapter 10, verse 7. Um, and, 
and that he's got to actually act as a king. So it says there, let it be when these signs come to thee, that do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. In other words, Samuel's saying to him, I want you to act as a king. All right, now, when Samuel says to you, hey, listen, the whole nation, there's these magnificent things going to happen to you, and we'll look at those. Okay, you don't know what they are yet, but there's these things going to happen, and you're going to be moved by the Spirit, and when that happens, I want you to act as a king. What do you think you'd do? Well, what you wouldn't do is over the page in verse 5, and behold, Saul came from the herd out of the field. He went back to watching the donkeys. He's just been told to act like a king. And he goes back and he watches the donkeys in the field. Okay? So what does that tell you about him? Yeah? Yeah? He's not spiritually proactive. Okay. He's not spiritually proactive. He's just been told to act like a king. And he doesn't. He just lapses back into his old, the old thing he was doing. He's not proactive in a spiritual sense. All right? Um, now, chapter 10, verse 22. What do you think of this one? So, they're going to anoint him king. Verse 22, it says, And when they inquired after Yahweh further, because they couldn't find him, it was said, Oh, he's hid himself among the stuff. So Saul's gone and hid himself. Now, most people think this is about Saul when Saul's humble. I don't think it is. Why do you think he hid himself? Yeah, he's avoiding. He's hiding from spiritual responsibility. Okay. So, you know, Saul actually, when it all comes down to it, he loved being out in front. Love being a ladies' man, that when it actually came to, he realized that all the nations being called together, all the tribes have been called together, and now he's actually going to be there on the pedestal as king. He realizes he actually hasn't got what it takes, okay? And he goes and hides himself because he actually is hiding from spiritual responsibility, okay? Right, now, what about um, chapter 11, verse 7? Okay, so he's. He's moved by these Ammonites who are going to poke these, um, these, the men of Jabesh's eyes out. Okay? And look what he does. Okay, so as he's, he's moved by this, and, and, and he took a yoke of oxen, verse 7, and he hewed them in pieces, sends them throughout the whole land of Israel, and he says, whoever doesn't come forth after Saul and Samuel, and notice the order there, Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. What kind of a leader? A leader that leads by? Yeah, okay, that's good. So he doesn't lead by inspiration. He leads by fear, not inspiration. All right, okay. He leads by fear and not inspiration. And then the last one, well, he actually wins that battle, all right, in verse 13. And it says, and, and so then there's some people that actually say, oh, who said Saul shouldn't reign over us? Let's, let's kill them. And Saul actually stands up and says, no, no. Saul said, verse 13, there shall not a man be put to death this day, for today Yahweh has wrought salvation in Israel. That is the one and only time that Saul ever shows the smallest amount of humility. Okay? So he's capable... Capable of humility. Okay. He is capable of it. All right. 
Now, young people, this, when you look at this list, he's irresponsible, never sees a job right through, unprepared, egotistical, spiritually blind, he's a liar, he's self-centered, he's not spiritually proactive, he hides from spiritual responsibility, he leads by fear, not inspiration, but there's one small glimmer of hope, and that is that he is capable of humility. Okay, and you know what, young people? That is how we all start. We all, before we come to Christ, are like that. That is what we are like as before we are molded by Christ and by God, before God works on our character. Yes, when I look at that list, I actually think, gee, there's a lot of soul in me because often I am irresponsible. You know, I don't always see every job right the way through. Sometimes I am unprepared, okay, in ecclesial life. Maybe it's just that I don't practice the reading before on Sunday, you know, if I'm reading or something like that. Maybe I don't prepare for Sunday school properly, whatever, okay? Sometimes I am egotistical. Sometimes I am spiritually blind. We've all told lies, haven't we? Sometimes it's all about me. I'm self-centered. Maybe I'm not always spiritually proactive. Maybe I hide from spiritual responsibility when people ask me to do things in ecclesial life and I don't always want to do it. And so I hide away from that. And I say, oh, no, I'm busy when I'm not really. Okay? Maybe I lead by making rules instead of leading by principle. Okay? Lead by fear, not by inspiration. All right, so you see, young people, we all actually are like that. And what needs to happen is we need to let God work in our lives and mold our characters. Okay? And that's exactly what God is going to do with Saul. And God actually says to Saul, you know what? If you let me work with you, I can change you from that. And you know what? And this is what, okay, so this is these three signs that he gives him. Now, now let's look at these, those three signs. Okay, so chapter 10. All right, so, so Samuel actually says to Saul in chapter 10, okay, you are going to go from this place now, and you, there's three signs that are going to happen. And it's going to show you that God is with you. Now, look at the end of verse 7. All right, let it be when these signs, so chapter 10, verse 7, let it be when these signs come upon you, do as occasion serve thee. In other words, act as a king because God is with you. All right, so that's what the purpose of these three signs are going to be, to show you that God is going to be with you, Saul. All right, so what's the first one? Verse 2, when you departed from me today, you're going to find two men by Rachel sepulchre. Okay, two men by Rachel sepulchre. So what's actually happening here is Saul's going to go home back to Gibeah and he's actually following the same route as what Jacob and his family took when they came back from Laban. All right, and there was a whole lot of things that happened on the way when he came back from Laban. Okay, and it's, and it's all about Jacob's spiritual journey as he's, he's left Laban, okay, and, all, and, and, and how Laban cheated him and then he's left Esau. Remember Esau came with 400 men um, and he was going to kill him, but then he didn't. And, and then he's left the events of Shechem behind with Dinah and Simeon and Levi. He's left all those things behind. Okay, and he's going up to Bethel because God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and, and renew your family and, and their vows and all that. And, 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 and on the way, Jacob's name has changed from Jacob to, to, uh, to Israel, isn't it? So this is actually Jacob going from a natural man to a spiritual man. And Saul is going to be going from a natural man to a spiritual man on exactly the same road. And so Samuel's saying to him, as you're going on that same journey as Jacob took, you're going to go past Rachel's sepulchre. Now, who was Rachel? Well, it was his mom, wasn't it? Rachel, she died giving birth to well, his great-great-great-grandmom, okay? So Rachel was his great-great-grandmother who died giving birth to Benjamin. All right, so you're going to come past Rachel's sepulchre. Okay, and then, you're going to, and, and then what's going to happen? And you're going to see two men. Two ordinary men are going to be there. All right, and they're going to tell you that the asses are found. Okay, so what is this, what is this actually telling us? So you've got two ordinary men, and you're going past Rachel Sepulchre, who's used as natural mother. Rachel, who had to learn to put God first because, and, 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 and rely upon God for the, the, uh, to look after the natural working of her body, to give her children. Okay. And the asses represent daily life and all the, the cares of daily life, you know, because you use the asses on the farm to plow and things like that, okay? And these two ordinary men are going to tell you that the asses are found. 
And so what the lesson is for Saul is, Saul, God is going to be with you if you leave the natural cares of life up to me and you put the truth first. All right, Saul? So all these three are all about God's going to be with you. So Saul, God's going to be with you if you leave the natural cares of life to God and you put the truth first. All right? That's the first sign that's going to happen to you. All right, then what's going to happen? All right, so you've got to put God first. All right, then verse 3. And then you're going to go forward from thence, okay? And you're going to come to the plain of table. Now that word, the plain of table, actually in Rotherham says the oak of table. Okay, so it's actually an oak tree. And there at the oak of Tabor was where when Jacob came to the oak of Tabor, that's where they buried all the false gods. Okay, so Rachel had stolen all those, those teraphim and, they'd, and the other women um, had these idols that, you know, um, from, it was Shechem, yeah, from Shechem. And they'd be now incorporated into, into Jacob's family and they buried all those idols underneath the oak tree at, at Shechem, uh, sorry, at Tabor. They buried the idols underneath that oak tree. And they also buried uh, Rachel's, no, Rebecca's nurse. So that was the last vestige of Jacob's old life, was Rachel's nurse. They buried her underneath the oak tree as well. Okay, so when you come to the, the oak of Tabor, there you're going to meet three men. Okay, so not two natural, ordinary men now. You're going to meet three men, and they're going up to God, to Bethel. And they're carrying kids, so the kids are goats. And, and bread and wine. So these are three spiritual men, and they're going up to worship. Okay? So, what we have here now is you're going to meet three spiritual men carrying the emblems of worship, bread and wine. Okay? And they're going to break bread with you in verse 4. They will salute you and give you two loaves of bread, and you're going to receive it of their hand. Okay? So what does this sign mean? It says, God, God saying, Samuel saying, God will be with you, Saul, if you bury your past way of life. Okay, bury the idols beneath the oak. You're going to bury your past way of life, Saul, and come into fellowship with me. All right? So God will be with you, Saul, if you bury your past way of life and come into fellowship with me. All right? Then, verse 5, and after that, so that's the second sign, and after that you're going to come to the hill of God. So the hill of God is, is, is actually Gibeah Elohim. Okay, it's actually Saul's hometown. Okay, the hill of God, Gibeah Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. Okay, so, so this is Saul's hometown. He's going to come home now. Now he's in fellowship with God, and he's going to be able to rise into the, up, up this hill of God to heavenly places, okay? Heav heavenly places in Christ, as it were. But there's also a, gar a garrison of the Philistines there, okay? And, and we actually know there's a school of the prophets there as well. So, so what that's actually saying is... You know, even when we leave behind our past way of life, our human nature, this garrison of the Philistines is still there in our lives, okay? But there's also the school of the prophets there as well. So um, even when we're in fellowship with God, we've still got our human nature that drags us down, okay? And there, actually what's going to happen is you're now going to come across a whole company of prophets, okay? So now it's not just two ordinary men. It's not just three spiritual men. You're now coming across a whole company of prophets, Okay, and they're coming down from the high place and they've got a psaltery and tab a tabret and they've got all these, these uh, instruments of, of worship for music. Okay, and what's going to happen in verse 6 is you're going to be turned into another man. Okay, so what God is saying to him here is when you're in fellowship with me, Saul, okay, and you've got the spiritual influence of these other men, this whole company of prophets, they're going to help you to develop a new and a godly character. Okay, so God will be with you, Saul, if you allow your character to be developed and changed by the influence of spiritual men. Okay, so that's the lesson. So you see what Saul was like. This is what he was like. He was irresponsible, never seeing a job right through, unprepared, and all those characteristics. And God says, listen, I'm going to be with you. You put me first. You put the truth first. And then you bury your past way of life, and then you come into fellowship with me. Okay, and you develop... You come and you surround yourself with a godly people who will influence you for good. And they will help you change from that and become the person that I want you to be. Okay? And that's exactly what Saul failed to do. He never, ever, ever followed these three signs. And I'm going to show you that now. Okay, so let's go into this cameo of his life. Okay? And let's have a look at this um, in the cameo of his life. 
Okay, so chapter 13. All right, so chapter 13. <clears throat> um, right, let's read from verse 3. Okay, so he's reigned uh, one year or two years, as the first verse says. Okay, it's a little bit ambiguous there as to what the Hebrew is. Um, I think these are actually three separate incidents that are, in these, that are taken out of his life. It doesn't necessarily happen all in the first two years. But be that it is, mate, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, so the first thing that happens here is, and verse 3, Jonathan, sent, uh, Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines. Now look at verse 4. And all Israel heard that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines. What do you make of that? Uh, this is a little bit of, uh, yeah, well, Jonathan, he was just acting under my command, you know, like, uh, you know? It's egotistical, isn't it? Can't handle the fact that his son, and you know, that happens again. Turn over the page. Chapter 14. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his armor bearer, and he goes up and he smites his garrison of the Philistines. Two battles started by Jonathan. Was it true that, small, that Saul smote the garrison of the Philistines? Was that true? Come on, guys. No, it's a lie. Saul did not smite the garrison of the Philistines. It was Jonathan. But Saul puts the word out, oh, I've smitten the garrison of the Philistines. Okay? It's a lie. Okay. He's egotistical and he's a liar. And all the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. All right. So that is a lie. Now, look at verse 7 and 8. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. For Saul was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Okay, so much for this great king that they wanted to lead them out to battle. All the people have followed him trembling. Okay, now he had actually been told by Samuel to go down to Gilgal. Just turn back a page, a couple of pages to um, verse 8 of chapter 10. So remember when in verse 7 it says, you know, when, when, when these signs actually come to you, and they did happen, and Saul was changed into another man, okay, and he ended up prophesying, and, okay, and it, was, it was a big moment in his life. Well, Samuel said to him in verse 8, okay, when you see that God is with you, you're going to go down before me to Gilgal. So this is chapter 10, verse 8. You're going to go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices and of peace offerings. Seven days you must tarry till I come, and I will show you what to do. Okay, so Saul is given a very specific commandment to go down to Gilgal at, at a certain time and he's to wait for seven days until Samuel comes and he'll be told what to do. Okay, so this is it. It's now happened. Jonathan has attacked this thing. Saul takes the credit for it. Okay, and all the people are following Saul, but they're trembling because they're dead scared because he's not a leader. He's not leading by inspiration. And seven days go by and what happens? Okay, so verse 8. So now we're back in chapter 13, verse 8. He's, he's, they, the people are trembling at Gilgal. 13, verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the time set by Samuel. Okay? And Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. The, now, what is a shepherd supposed to do, young people? With his sheep? Yeah, not forget them. And is he supposed to let them get scattered? No. So you see what's happening. He's irresponsible. He's a bad shepherd. What do you think Saul should be doing right here, right now? If you were a proactive spiritual leader, what would you do? Reassure them. And what would you reassure them with? What has just happened to him? He's been given three signs that God will be with him. Surely you would think that he'd say, no, fellas, don't worry. 
God is with me. He gave me three signs, and they all happened. Okay, just turn back with me to Deuteronomy. To keep your hand here, Samuel, just turn back with me to Deuteronomy 20, verse 1 to 4. This is this exact scenario. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1 to 4. Okay, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1 to 4. When thou goest out to battle, and Saul would have known these words, all right? Well-known words in the law of Moses. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid of them, okay? Be not afraid of them, for Yahweh thy God is with thee. Okay, Saul... God will be with you if you do these things. Okay? Yahweh thy God will be with thee, which brought thee up of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when thou art come nigh to battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And Samuel was coming. He said he would come. Okay? He just had to have a bit of faith. Verse 3. Okay? And, and say to them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach to battle this day against your enemies. Let not your hearts be faint. Fear not and do not tremble. And what are the people doing? They are trembling next to Saul. You see that? Neither be terrified because of them. For Yahweh your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. That's what Saul should have been telling them. Don't worry guys. God is is with us and he's proved that to me so that's what a spiritual leader would do but you see Saul's not like that he's not spiritually proactive okay all right God wanted Saul to have a little bit of faith in the unseen spiritual reinforcements that were coming okay right so what does he then do well in verse 9 Saul says right well bring me the burnt offering okay and he offers the burnt offering so he usurps the priest's role what does that make him? Number five, spiritually blind. Couldn't see. There was another king of Israel that did that and he got leprosy straight in his forehead. Spiritually blind. Okay? Um, all right. So, and as a result, look what happens in verse two. So, um, he was in Michmash. All right. So, Saul chose him 3,000 men in verse two. 2,000 were the Saul in Michmash. All right, so that's the place where he was. Then verse 16, as a result of his stupidity here, Saul and Jonathan, verse 16, his son, and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped at Michmash. Well, guess what? He's just lost his place, hasn't he? He's, he has a territorial disadvantage now because now he was in Michmash. Now the Philistines are in Michmash. He's actually lost. Okay, and then verse 23 over the page. Okay, and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Michmash was actually a, a very strategic passage, okay? And, and he's now lost this. So you see what's actually happened here. Why has Saul lost this territory? Well, because he was unprepared. Look what actually happens here. Look at verse 20. No, verse 19 of this chapter 13. Now, there was no smith found in all the land of Israel. The Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all Israelites went to the Philistines to sharpen every man his, uh, his, his file and his, and his mattock in verse 21. Okay, and so, verse 22, So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in any of the hand of the people. Saul's had at least two years, young people, to prepare for battle. But you see, what kind of a character is Saul? Number three, he's unprepared. He's the only bloke, him and his son, with a sword. He's unprepared. See how those things, young people, are just shadows. Let God work with you and He'll change you. Leave God out of your life and that's what you like. That's what I'm like. Okay? So Saul had all he had at least two years to prepare. He's done nothing about it. And they go to battle and they haven't even got a sword to fight with. Unprepared. Okay, chapter 14. All right, Jonathan's proactive. Okay, 
Again in verse 1, it came to pass, Jonathan, the son of Saul, says to the young man, come, let us go over to these Philistines garrison. All right, so, now, Jonathan's being spiritually proactive here, okay? But look at Saul. And Saul tarried, and the Hebrew word there in verse 2, so it's chapter 14, verse 2, and Saul tarried, and the Hebrew word means to sit, okay? So Saul is sitting, where? In the uttermost part of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree. Now, what characteristic does that line up with? Well, I'd say it lines up with number, number eight, doesn't it? He's not being spiritually proactive. He's sitting on his tush underneath the pomegranate tree in the uttermost part of Gibeah, as far away as he can from the battle. Okay? And you know, that's not the only time that he does it. You know, later on in the record, he's actually sitting under a tree again. This time with a spear in his hand and all his all his cronies around him. Okay? He's not spiritually proactive. And Jonathan is out there saying, come on, let's go get these Philistines, blooming uncircumcised you know, individuals they are. Okay? He's not spiritually proactive. All right. So, now, look at verse 17. So Jonathan and his armor bearers slip away, and, they, and they're gone, and they, and, and they, um, and they, and they s- have this great victory over this Philistine garrison in the rest of this ch- in, in the first half of this chapter, and and all of a sudden there's this noise and amongst the, the host of the Philistines, as the Philistines are now beating up each other because Jonathan and the, his armor bearer have created this this battle there and, and they're winning, okay? And God's actually creating this earthquake and this that, that's that's actually happening in verse uh, 15. There's this very great trembling in the host, okay? And Saul all of a sudden sitting down there under his pomegranate tree goes, whoa! What's going on? There's a battle. Okay? And now look what he says in verse 17. And Saul said to the people that were with him, Number now and see who's gone from us. Number now and see who's gone from us. Now, what's, young people, what's the job of a shepherd? One. Two. Know where your sheep are. Two is to feed your sheep. And three is to protect your sheep. Yeah? Number now and see who's gone from us. A great shepherd, hey? Doesn't even know who's missing. Yeah? Doesn't even know the prince is missing. Hasn't been collaborating with him. Yeah? Okay. He's a bad shepherd. Irresponsible. Doesn't even know who's gone. Okay. So... Then, not only that, but look what he does in verse 27. So now, all of a sudden, he gets his, his act together. He goes, oh, let, let's, let's go off to battle now. And by the way, fellas, cursed be the man who eats anything while we go to battle. Real smart, huh? You're about to take your army out to battle, and you say, now, guys, you're not allowed to eat anything. Good shepherd feeds his flock. Okay? How dumb is that? That he is just seriously, seriously incompetent. Okay? Absolutely pathetic. All right? So he then goes and makes this curse. You know, he, he actually, it's, it's, it's actually trying to copy Joshua. Curse be the man that eats any food that I may be avenged of my enemies. That's not what Jonathan does. He says, let's go and get these uncircumcised Philistines. Okay? Saul sees these as his enemies, and he's the one who's, you know. Okay? So he's starving his army instead of feeding them. He's starving them instead of feeding them. He's a shocking shepherd. All right? All right. Now, well, as a result of this, Jonathan actually ends up eating some honeycomb. Doesn't, he, he wasn't even there. He doesn't even know that this has happened. Okay? And Jonathan ends up eating this honeycomb. And then... Um, what happens is God doesn't answer Saul later in the day when he wants to go in verse 36. Okay, Saul wants to go and spoil them by night. Okay, but the priest says, well, actually, I think we should ask God first, but God doesn't answer him. And so Saul says, okay, well, let's, let's find out who the problem is here. Okay, not realizing that actually, you know, he's the problem. All right, and so, well, then there's, they cast lots, and Saul's taken, and Jonathan, and then Jonathan's taken, and Saul says to him, oh, now... Jonathan, verse 43, Saul says to Jonathan, okay, um, tell me what thou hast done. And he's mimicking Joshua here. 
um, again to Achan, tell me what you've done, okay? And uh, Jonathan says, look, uh, I ate a little with this honey, you know, and, and lo, I must die. So Jonathan's actually going to sacrifice himself, okay? A little bit like Christ, uh, self-sacrifice. And look what Saul says. Look what Saul says in verse 44. And Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. He's now going to kill his son. He's now going to kill the very best of his sheep. Okay? Thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Well, the people actually go, no, this is ridiculous. No, this is just absolutely pathetic. All right? So they then say to Saul, you know, this is, he's wrought with God this day in verse 45. He has wrought with God. And, and so the people rescue Jonathan. Okay? So the people rescue the best sheep from the bad shepherd who's about to, to, about to kill him. So what does that make Saul? Saul does not recognize Jonathan's amazing spiritual qualities because he's spiritually blind himself, isn't he? So that's number five on the board there, he's spiritually blind. Okay? Couldn't see a spiritual thing when it's under his nose. All right. Actually, we haven't got time to look at it but now, but do you know who Saul set up as chief shepherd? Doeg. Doeg. And he was a? Edomite. Edomite. An Edomite of the, of, of the tribe, you know, from Esau, who was going to kill Jacob with his four, 400 men. Okay? And, and Jacob said, when, when Esau was coming, he's going to kill the mother with the children. What did Doeg do? Killed all those priests. So Saul uses his chief shepherd to kill the other shepherds. Okay? Number one. See that, young people? It all starts off. He couldn't even. He had his dad had to tell him to go and look for the donkeys because he'd lost them. All right. Um, all right, so, well, let's just quickly finish up in chapter, in chapter 15, okay? So chapter 15 is all about Amalek. Okay, so Amalek represents the flesh, it represents carnal thinking, all right? You know the story from Sunday school, how the Amalekites, you know, uh, came against Israel when they left, all right? Well, Saul's now told to actually go and smite Amalek, all right? And to kill them in, in verse 3, smite Alec, Amalek, utterly destroy them, don't spare them. You've got to kill men, women, children, ox, ass, suckling, camel, the whole lot. You kill every single thing, okay? Then you don't leave one thing that breathes, okay? That's what the command was. Interestingly, that's exactly what Doeg did to the city of the priests. And it says that in chapter 22, verse 19, he killed every living thing, camels and asses as well. Okay, so Saul, and Saul expected Doeg to obey him. And yet in this chapter, he doesn't do it himself. Okay, when he's told to by God. Okay, so, well, um, so he's told to, and look what, it, look what it says. So he doesn't do it, does he? It says, and Saul, verse 7, smote the Amalekites. Okay, and he, verse 8, he took Agag. Verse 9, and Saul and the people spared Agag. And verse, in the middle of verse 9, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. Okay. So, of course, he hasn't done it. He would not destroy them. And so when Samuel comes and says, okay, so what's all this bleating that I hear now? Okay. Saul says, no, I have. Verse 13, I have performed the commandment of Yahweh. Okay. And verse 15, and Saul says to Samuel, they... They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared. Is that true? No, it's not true. He's a liar, isn't he? He's a liar. The people spared. And what is he doing? He's hiding behind other people, isn't he? And that's what he did in chapter, in chapter 9. He was hiding. Or in chapter 10, he was hiding from spiritual responsibility. He doesn't want to kill the flesh. He just wants to hide from spiritual responsibility. And he, bla he hides behind the people and he lies about it. Okay. Well, um, we're going quite quickly through this. Verse 20. Look what it says in verse 20. So Samuel obviously says to him, um, Nah, look, verse 19. 
Why did you, um, you know, go, well, verse 18, look, you know, God sent you on this journey. Go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. It was a, it was a whole parable because the, the Amalekites represented flesh, okay? And, 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 and what did you do, Saul, in verse 19? Verse, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of Yahweh and didst fly upon the spoil, okay? You were, it was as if the truth was so restrictive. As soon as you get the, uh, the opportunity to do something, Okay, you fly upon the spoil of the world. All these worldly things that you just heap into yourself, Saul. Okay, because you don't want to get rid of them out of your life. Okay, one of the signs was dedicate yourself to the truth, and then I'll be with you. Okay, and so Saul says in verse 20, Saul says to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of, of, of Yahweh. At the end of verse 20, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Is that true? Apart from Agag, is that true? No, it's not. Why? How do you know? Because there was a whole lot of Amalekites that went and took David's wives from Ziklag just a few years later. And those Amalekites didn't come from nowhere. Okay? Saul had left enough Amalekites there to go and take all of David's wives and children and all the herds and everything and take them away. And David went and, and, and got them and killed a lot of them except 400 that escaped on camels, it says in chapter 30. Okay? Saul is a liar. He did not utterly destroy the Amalekites. Agag was not the only one that survived. Okay? And then he blames it on the people again in verse 21. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, verse, um, verse 17 says, And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight. And you see, there was the thing. So Samuel actually says to, 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 to him, when you were humble, you are capable of humility. And he did. Remember when he destroyed um, those people back in, uh, in chapter 11? Or was it 12? Uh, chapter 11. It says, uh, Yahweh hath wrought great salvation this day when he destroyed the Ammonites. He gave God the glory, didn't he? Okay? That was when he was little in his own eyes and he, and he should have done what God said. Okay. Now, let's just look at one more. Okay. Look at verse 30. You think, you know, Saul was, you know, he was a ladies' man, wasn't he? He was egotistical. Well, look at this in verse 30. So now he begs Samuel. He says, oh, look, you know, he's been rejected now in verse 26. And he says in verse 30, I have sinned. And so Samuel says, I'm not going to turn and worship with you. All right? But, but Saul really, really can't handle being put down in front of his people because he's egotistical. All right? We saw that. He was talking, he's a ladies' man. He's talking to all the girls instead of going to the, the elders of the city. But now look at verse 30. He says, but, and Then he said, I've sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship Yahweh thy God. Okay? See, he can't handle, he's egotistical, he cannot handle not being seen to be the big guy in front of everybody. Okay? Now I'll just show you this one. Just, just quickly turn with me to chapter 18, verse, verse 8. You know, Saul was such a ladies' man. In fact, he loved the praise of the women so much. Look at this. So when, when, the, when David's gone out and slain his ten thousands, and then the woman comes singing, all right? Look what it says in verse 6. And it came to pass when they came. So this is now the rest of his life, okay? So this is now not in the cameo of his life. This is now in the rest where he just makes the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. Well, look in chapter, six, in, in chapter 18, verse 6. And it came to pass as, the, the woman, uh, as they came, and David returned from the store of the Philistine, that the woman came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets and joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another, Saul slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and it displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me, to me, They've only ascribed thousands. And look what he then says. And what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul saw the kingdom as only one little step above the praise of all the women. Love talking to the ladies because he's egotistical. Okay? 
See that, young people? Well, we've, we've run out of time completely, all right? But hopefully what that's shown you, young people, is this. Is that when we start off in the truth, when we start off, we are like this, okay? Irresponsible, never seeing a job right through. And we don't, we're not all like this, okay? And we're not all, all of these characteristics. But these kind of things are natural to us, okay? But what we have to do, young people, is allow God to work in our lives. We have to allow Him to work in our lives and mold and shape our character. And that's exactly what Saul did. And it's, it's easy to throw mud at Saul, okay? Because he was just such a clown. But what we need to do is we need to look at this and go, yeah, okay. So in the rest of your studies this year, as you see all these people like David and Hushai and all the people that are around Saul and, 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 and Jonathan, and, they were, and God's using these people to, to mold Saul's character or trying to mold Saul's character. Okay, because what we have got here, God said to him, God said, I'm going to give you, in fact, you know what, oh, there's another classic, and we're not going to look at it now, but you know those spiritual men, that, that, that's, that whole company of prophets? Well, in, 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 later on in, the chap, in, in that chapter, or in a couple of chapters, Saul actually sees every strong man, okay, and he takes him to him. So all the spiritual men are gone from around Saul, and he's only got these strong men around him. So Saul got rid of all the spiritual friendships, and all he did was took strong men because he thought that that was where his strength was going to lie. So young people, the thing is, we need to actually look to God, look to Christ, look to each other. Who's the most important person in the kingdom? Is it you? Is it me? Who is it? Yeah, that could be right. Oh, okay, how do I make that one right? Okay, so you go sit next to the king. Who's the most important person in the kingdom? It's the person sitting next to you. It's the person's... You are not the most important person. Okay? We live in a world of selfies. Okay? Where self is everything. All right? It's not about you or me. It's about the person sitting next to you. We have got to help each other, young people, get into the kingdom. All right, God bless you all. Thanks for that, Barrett. That was really insightful. It's interesting to see how similar we can be at times to Saul. So hopefully we can all let God work in our lives so that we can leave some of those characteristics behind. So for anyone who wants to be proactive and to see some jobs through, the AYC committee is looking for people to help out with their working bee. So if you're interested, come up and see Zach Hain at the front and he'll add you to the chat. So we're going to close now with a song, um, Come Let Us Go to the Mountain, and it'll be followed by prayer through Remy.
to Yahweh our God. We approach before your throne, thankful for this opportunity to be at another suburban class, to be with friends, to be encouraged, to be uplifted and joyful as your youth. Help us to take the lessons we learnt from Uncle Barrett tonight. You are always with us, even when we can be unfaithful. We all can be irresponsible, self-centered, unprepared or spiritually inactive, but we must let you work in our lives and mould and shape our character. Help us apply these principles into our lives so that wherever we go or whoever we speak to can see us as ambassadors for your son, declaring his righteousness in all that we do. We are aware that life can change in an instant, so help us to always be ready, with our lamps trimmed, waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ back to earth. We pray that the seed of your word may grow in the hearts of all the young people. As today, that seed grew in the hearts of three new brothers and sisters, Ethan Lawson, Benji Ryan, and Lily Stone, who are now all a part of your divine family. Thank you for their example and leading them to this point. Guide them on their journey and continue to care for them as a shepherd his sheep. We thank you for, this, uh, for the amazing blessings of our lives, that we are allowed to be a part of a community who care for each other and nurture and console one another. We are also thankful at this time for the supper which has been provided and the loving hands that prepared it. We ask that you bless the endeavours and efforts of the committee and that you bless the activities and events planned if it's according to your will. Help them make the right decisions to help us as a collective group of young people from all walks of life. Send your son soon, we pray. He accomplished something we could never do. He showed your perfect character in our flesh and offered us salvation, and we thank you for the enormity of that work. It is through him, our high priest and mediator, we offer this prayer. Jesus Christ, amen. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our SYP March class. It's great to see the hall full and to see so many enthusiastic faces here tonight. Thanks, Uncle Barrett, for your study. There's so many awesome lessons for us to take into the next four weeks before our next class about Saul and David. And thanks also to Zach, Corey, Liv, Joe and Remy. The collection for tonight is for SYP and the collection details on the screen are on the screen. We also want to give a very warm welcome tonight to some visitors who have joined us all the way from Canada. Uh, we have Jordan Jackson and Josh and Tali McStravick, um, so please make sure that they feel very welcome. Uh, we also have a number of new starters here with us at SYP for the first time, and they are Elliot Perinacci, Ethan Jeffress and Laurie Farron. Uh, we want to give you a very warm welcome to SYP, and could you please, after the class, come and find me uh, to collect a welcome letter. Since our last class as well, Sam Matakanake, Rachel Beard, Toby, Luke were all baptised and sounds like I've missed a couple from Remy's prayer as well, so congratulations to them. And also Steve and Emily Cadeau were married yesterday. So congrats to all those young people and we pray that God will be with you. After the class, uh, there is supper provided in the room out the back and to help with the supper clean-up are uh, Micah Jolly, Pia Mugford, Emma Martin, Abby Reynolds, Michaela Brumby, Ari Mansfield and Levi Lund. Uh, please head out to the supper room at about 9 o'clock, um, maybe 9.30 now. Um, also, there is a bag of lost property from our February class up the front. If there's anything left on the stage after the class, it's, it might be lost forever. So make sure you claim your items after the class. Um, and also, if anyone wants, a pro anyone wants a program for 2023, please feel, to, feel free to come down the front and collect a program. A reminder that our SYP talks for, from the 2022 series on Acts are being uploaded to our SYP podcast on Spotify. There were so many great talks last year, um, and we've uploaded from February to July, so... Uh, make sure you visit that podcast to have a listen to them again. Now, SYP is very excited. I don't think we're quite as excited as Toby Duperuzo is, um, but we're still very excited to launch uh, the 2023 season for uh, the Suburban Soccer League. 
At, <laughs> um, and to launch the season, some lads have put together an amazing video for us to watch, which we'll just play now. Shem, could I have some extra line? Lights off. <laughs> QR code will be up on the screen afterwards. Um, so both um, lads and, and girls can book in using the QR code on the screen at the end. Um, and if you have any questions about the season, please see Toby um, or Shem um, after the class. Um, now, within the next week, a story is going to be added to our Instagram page for you to be able to anonymously write a note to the family of Ethan. Uh, we wanted to give you another opportunity to write a message if you weren't um, at our February class. And if you wanted to write, handwrite a note, um, there is a book and a box in the foyer after the class as well. Now, at our next class, Brad Mitsos is going to speak about the Sons of Zeruiah. Um, and the theme for that class is Family Intrigue, Politics and Assassination. Um, quite an interesting theme there. Um, that's on Saturday the 29th of April at Heritage College. 
Till then, we hope you enjoy the Adelaide Youth Conference and we look forward to seeing you all at the conference or our next class.